computer is a device that has four primary functions, input, output, processing, and storage. It accepts data as input, processes it, outputs the processed data, and optionally stores it. All of this can be done on large quantities of data and at mind-boggling speeds. However, a computer in and of itself is actually quite dumb. It cannot solve problems on its own. It needs to be told how to solve problems. The computer programmer is the problem solver. It is this person who finds a generic set of steps to follow to come to a solution to a particular type of problem. A collection of such steps can be referred to as an algorithm. The steps of an algorithm are written as instructions that the computer can read that tell it how to process the input data to compute the appropriate output data. A computer is an electronic device, therefore it knows nothing about spoken languages. It knows only how to read electricity. That means we must translate our instructions from human understandable form into a form the computer can understand. Electricity flows through integrated circuits, which are made up of billions of tiny transistors. At the risk of oversimplifying the electrical engineering aspect, but in the interest of keeping this explanation as simple as possible, we will just say that they can be switched on or off. These two states, on and off, can be represented in the binary number system as 0 and 1. Humans typically think in terms of the decimal number system, meaning we have 10 numbers. When we reach the highest possible number and need to increment it further, we simply add another digit to the number, starting the sequence over, where 9 becomes 0 and we add a 1 to the left of it to get 10. It is believed by many that we came to use this numbering system as a result of having 10 fingers to count on. You can think of your computer as having only two fingers to count on. Therefore, all instructions for it must be given in binary. If you're still having trouble grasping the concept, you can also think of it as if your computer only understands Morse code, which has just two characters in its alphabet. Since data is read and processed in binary, we refer to each binary digit as a bit. There are eight bits in a byte. A byte is the smallest unit of data that can be addressed. Because translating every possible instruction into a series of zeros and ones can be both tedious and error-prone, we have developed what we refer to as low-level programming language known as assembly. Assembly uses a mnemonic to represent each low-level machine instruction or operation. It is converted into machine code by a program known as an assembler. Because even assembly itself is also very tedious and error-prone, we've further gone on to develop high-level programming languages. These are languages that are more easily read and used by humans, but which also have very specific syntax rules that are used to convert the human-readable code into machine-readable code. As previously mentioned, C++ is a high-level programming language. The program used to do this conversion is known as a compiler. When you finish writing code for a program, you need to build that code into executable machine code. The build process involves three steps, the preprocessor, the compiler, and the linker. We'll get more into what these do once we start coding. There are many different categorizations of software, but most fall under two general categories, system software and application software. Your operating system is system software, as it is the base program your computer runs to interface with its hardware and allow other software to run. Application software is pretty much everything else you run on your computer, such as web browsers, games, and word processors. Games are application software, so we won't focus much on system software. Before we move on, I'd like to quickly introduce you to some common terminology that you should be familiar with, as these terms may be used over and over throughout these lessons. Some have already been introduced, and some are new, but be sure to learn them all. ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. This is used to represent characters. ASCII characters are represented in one byte, therefore there are 256 different possible ASCII values. Unicode. Like ASCII, Unicode is used to represent characters. However, Unicode characters are represented in two bytes, allowing for a wider variety of international languages. Decimal system, base 10 number system, the one we normally use in day-to-day -day speech. Binary system, base 2 number system, there are only two numbers in this system, 0 and 1. Hexadecimal system, base 16 number system, there are 16 numbers in this system. 0 through 9 is represented by 0 through 9, and 10 through 15 is represented by A through F. Octal system, base 8 number system. There are 8 numbers in this system. Kilobyte, 1000 bytes or 1024 bytes. 1024 is a power of 2, and 1000 is a power of 10. Machines think in binary, so their hardware storage often comes in powers of 2. Humans usually think in decimal, so sometimes amounts of memory are given in decimal. Both are frequently used by advertisers, which can cause confusion for consumers. A 1 gig disk drive might actually be 10 to the 9 bytes, 
instead of 2 to the 30th, so you'd be getting less storage. Furthermore, some of the space gets used for formatting. This is why you might buy a 300 gig hard drive, but only see maybe 280 available when you boot up. An uppercase K is supposed to be used for base 2, and a lowercase K is supposed to be used for base 10, but this is not a standard and not everyone abides by it. Kilobit, 1000 bits or 1024 bits. Once again, Kilo here is used to represent both base 10 and base 2 measurements, so it can be confusing. Bits are often used to advertise throughput speeds by internet service providers to give the illusion of a higher number than using kilobytes per second. Floating point number, a fraction, also sometimes referred to as a real. CPU, central processing unit, the hardware that processes data on your computer, often referred to as the brains of the computer. Compiling, translating human readable code into machine readable instructions. Assembly, a low level programming language, each statement corresponds to a single machine code instruction. It is converted into executable machine code by an assembler. When you compile C++, your code actually gets translated into assembly first, then assembled into relocatable object code. GUI, graphical user interface. Pretty graphics used to facilitate input and output for the user of the software. For example, using menus and buttons instead of command lines. Millisecond. 1 1,000th of a second, abbreviated as MS. The amount of time it takes for a program to execute an operation is often measured in milliseconds. Algorithm, a set of steps that describe how to solve a certain kind of problem. Bug, a problem in your code that causes crashes, hangs, or otherwise unintended behavior. Compiler error, an error in the syntax of your code. Linker error, your code is syntactically correct, but your linker can't find all the pieces it needs. Crash. Your program compiles and links, but when you run it, it stops working and has to be shut down. Hang. Your program gets stuck, but doesn't necessarily crash. Debug. To find and fix errors in your program. Armed with some basic terminology and a desire to create, let us move on to setting up our environment for programming. For the remainder of this lesson, I will walk you through setting up an IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. When you write code, you need something to write it on. This is typically done in a plain text editor and the code you write is referred to as source code. Notepad could work fine. Once that code is written, you run it through a compiler which invokes the preprocessor before compiling. Then it attempts to translate the code into machine code. If the compiler comes across syntax it does not understand, it will generate an error message and will not compile. You must fix the error before it can be compiled. Once your code is compilable, the compiler will translate it into machine code and produce one or more output files known as object files. Then the linker is invoked. The linker brings it all together to produce an executable file. On Windows, this would be the .exe that you double click to run a program. These are a lot of steps, though you can do them each separately in a command line interface, it's much easier and wiser to do them in an IDE. The IDE is a software package that bundles the compiler, linker, and text editor together all in one. You write code into the text editor, press a button to invoke the compiler, and then an executable is spit out into your project folder. There are many IDEs available. A common older one is Dev C++, but this is no longer maintained and no longer complies with the current C++ standard. Don't use it. There is also Codeblocks, which is a free IDE available for all platforms. There are many others, but one that dominates the industry is Microsoft's Visual Studio. As a Linux fanboy and advocate of cross-platform software, I typically loathe Microsoft products and business tactics. However, Visual Studio is a godsend. It comes with a wonderful set of indispensable features. Although it has several of Microsoft's own extensions that are not a part of the C++ standard, standard C++ code will compile on it. As of this video, most modern compilers do not yet fully support C++11, and VC++ is no exception. It does support many of C++11's new features, but some are still missing. Because this is such a widely used and insanely awesome IDE, Visual Studio is what I will be using in these lessons, and it is what I will expect you to use. If you run into issues using other IDEs or other compilers, please do not post here complaining about it. I don't have the time to care about it, and odds are that question has already been asked and answered before. Just Google your way to the solution. You're a problem solver now, so solve your problem. In any case, I do still believe in platform independence. Therefore, even though I'll be using Microsoft's IDE, I'll try to keep the code as standards compliant as possible, so that it should work on most other modern compilers. Having said that, let's begin setting up our IDE. If you're a student in any IT-related field, you should be eligible for a DreamSpark
Art account, in which you can acquire a copy of Visual Studio 2013 Ultimate at no cost. If you're not a student or otherwise do not have access to this IDE for free, you can purchase the Professional Edition from Microsoft, or you can download a 30-day free trial. You can also download the free 2012 Express Edition. If it's possible, be sure to get 2013, not 2010 or 2012. I will be using Visual Studio 2013 Ultimate throughout these lessons, so if you're using another version, some of the options and features I use may vary or be absent. I also use a plugin called Visual Assist X. If you don't get this, again, some features I use may be non-existent for you, in which case you'll have to do some things manually instead of having them automated for you. Visual Assist is a handy add-on that provides extra features that make programming faster and easier. This extension can be downloaded through Visual Studio's Extension Manager or by visiting wholetomato.com directly for a 30-day free trial. If you're a student, you can buy it for $49. I know that sounds kind of sales pitchy, but I'm not being paid by anyone to endorse these products. I genuinely view them as invaluable resources. Adding Visual Assist is not a necessary step here, but it's something you'll end up doing if you continue to pursue software development, and it's something you'll wish you did sooner by the time you realize how awesome it is. Your installation experiences may vary with different versions of Visual Studio, but these steps should guide you in the right direction. Before installing, I'd strongly urge you to reboot your computer to eliminate some of the very strange Microsoft problems that can cause hiccups during installation. Once your download is complete and you've rebooted, launch the ISO. Windows should mount the ISO and prompt you to open the folder to view files. Launch the executable. A window like this will pop up. Read the end user license agreement, check the too long didn't read box, also known as the box that says you agree to it, and click install. You'll see this window for a long time while it installs. Feel free to grab a sandwich while you wait. If you're presented with a series of options for installation like this, you may install them all or just install Visual C++. If you're presented with this screen, choose Visual C++ Development Settings. Once you're in Visual Studio, it'll look similar to this, but probably with an uglier color scheme and font. The next thing to do is install Visual Assist. Even if you don't want to, follow along anyway to familiarize yourself with how to find the extension. At the top, click on the Tools menu and choose Extensions and Updates. In the left pane, expand Online and highlight Visual Studio Gallery. In the search box in the top right, type in Visual Assist. When you see it show up in the list, click on the download button that appears next to it. It will take you to the site to start the download, and when you run it, it should just be one or two clicks. It will integrate seamlessly with Visual Studio. Since the release of Visual Studio 2013, Microsoft has released a new compiler for it that has more support for C++11. To get it, visit this site and download it. There is no extra charge. This is not a necessary step, as I won't actually be using this new compiler. Once this is all set up, you'll probably want to make a few minor adjustments. Line numbers are a useful feature to enable, and I'm not sure why they aren't enabled by default. Go to Tools, Options, and expand Text Editor in the left pane. Select All Languages. On the right, you'll see a checkbox for line numbers. If it's empty or has a square in it, click it until it's a checkmark. In the future, if you want to change the colors used for your text editor, you can navigate to Tools, Options, and expand Environment in the left pane. Select Fonts and Colors. From there, you can choose whatever colors you desire. If you use Visual Assist, some of the colors in here are already provided by Visual Studio, some added by Visual Assist, and some overlap between both. Whatever colors you choose for Visual Assist will override the related ones provided by Visual Studio, so it's best to make them match, or disable the Visual Assist colors. When you create projects, they will be housed in what's called a solution. A solution can have several projects within it. A project will house the code for one specific program, which is often divvied up into filters. To create a new project, click on File, New, and Project. Make sure Visual C++ is highlighted in the left pane. In the middle pane, you're going to be creating a Win32 console application for the vast majority of these tutorials. Don't let the name fool you, this doesn't mean we're going to be using the Win32 API. At the bottom, name your project on the top line, choose its location in the middle line, and name your solution on the bottom line. Check the box for Create Directory Solution if you want the project and all of its source code to be contained in its own folder inside the Solution folder. In the next window that pops up, click Application Settings on the left, or click Next. Check the box for Empty Project. Make sure the radio button for console application is selected, then click Finish. If the Solution Explorer in the right pane isn't already selected, select it. This shows you a list of your project's current files, of which you should have none. You'll have four empty filters named External Dependencies, 
header files, resource files, and source files. Note that these filters do not correspond to actual folders in your hard drive. They are there purely as organizational tools for the programmer. On your hard drive, all these files are in the same folder together. Adding a filter does not add a folder. Some people like to sync up their filters with their folders so that it's easier to locate files on the hard drive. Instead of doing that, you can simply click on the Show All Files icon at the top of the Solution Explorer. This will show you the actual files and folders as they exist in your project directory on the hard drive. Adding a folder here will add a folder on the hard drive. I prefer this method, so that's what I'm going to be doing from now on. To create a file to write source code in for your first program, right click on your project and select Add New Item. Choose C++ file from the list and give it a name. For now, we're going to call it main.cpp. Then click Add. You will see your new main.cpp file in the Solution Explorer on the right, and it should automatically open in the text editor. Now is when you may begin typing code. For that, tune in to Lesson 2.